from the Unreasonable Doubt Studios, in association with Fighter Productions, this is Laying Down the Law, with your host, Billy DeClerc, and co-hosts, Kristen Drenning and Curtis Rutherford. Featuring a jury of genius jokesmiths and paneled with the help of Publishers Clearinghouse, auditors from the firm of DCH Lottery Management, and selected by random draw from a hermetically sealed mayonnaise jar every Tuesday and Thursday at half past never. Only a madman would bring these people together to construct an entire virtual world of law and order simply to tear it asunder with ruckus laughter. That madman is attorney Billy DeClerc. The result is a podcast blasted to the farthest reaches of the interwebs. That podcast is this one, and it starts right now. Welcome to Laying Down the Law, a comedy podcast hosted by me, the guy who almost got to play the congas in a cover version of the 1976 saxophone anthem, Stolen Sweets, attorney Billy DeClerc. I'm co-host and actual lawyer and improviser and storyteller based out of Austin, Texas, the good part of Texas, uh, Kristen Drenning. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. We have two returning guests today from the greatest comedy team in the universe <laughs> of which I am a member. You're on mute. You can catch us live on stage the first Saturday of the month at the Pack Theater at the Broadwater in Los Angeles, California. Hello. Hey, Griffin. So nice to be here. <laughs> We're going to do a little bio here, okay? Go ahead, Kristen. It's, it's great to have you back. First, we'll welcome back Cal Arts alum and the woman of a thousand fake mustaches, actor, comic, and relentless impersonator of Christopher Walken, among others. Welcome, Joanna Senator. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. <laughs> wow, yeah. wow, wow, wow. Wowza. We got to hear that. <laughs> let's hear a little Christopher Walken from you, Joanna. Come on, let's do it. Pressure's on. Oh, oh, me, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wowy. <laughs> wow thing. Uh, never so, that's told. all that came out. Sorry. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Not to be outdone, we have the man of a half dozen real mustaches, best known for playing memorable <laughs> characters like Chad and Fred. I'm pleased to welcome back my brother from another mother. Nobody can really tell us apart, especially Joanna's mom. <laughs> true story. Taylor. Yeah. Very true story. Do you want to hear any Chad? Yeah, let's Please. hear Chad. Bring it on. Oh, what's up? Let's talk about law stuff. <laughs> you want to hear any, any uh, Fred? Yeah, Fred, go ahead. Hey, Fred. Cool law stuff. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> oh. That sounded like so, every classmate I had in law school, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm thrilled to have all of you here today. Well, let's jump right into it. This is a biggie and one of the ones I'm very excited about doing, the case of the week. <laughs> all right, the case of the week is Grimshaw versus Ford Motor Company. This is a 1981 case out of California. Let me give you the TLDR. Ford got socked with punitive damages because they created a car that they knew would explode on when it got rear-ended in order to save about 15 bucks per car. This, this one's got a lot of facts and a lot of law in it. So um, we're going to get into the details. But a trigger alert for those of you who um, are more sensitive, um, you may want to skip ahead about 30 seconds to five minutes. Or just, you know, listen to a different episode. This one's got some, uh, a little grisly detail. Um, oh, God, I wasn't warned about I, this. I, yeah, nobody told us. Uh, <laughs> if you Google Ford Pinto explosion on YouTube or any other video site, you will get the idea. Don't, don't do that. Don't no. do that. So the 19, a 1972 Pinto... Uh, was rear-ended and caught on fire in San Bernardino, California. And the driver, Lily Gray, passed away. And the passenger, Richard Grimshaw, um, was severely injured. So Gray and Grimshaw's families filed against, or sorry, Gray's family and Grimshaw sued Ford. Um, the actions were brought together for trial. At the end, the jury awarded $127.8 million in damages 125 million in punitive damages and $2,841,000 in compensatory damages to Grimshaw, as well as $665,000 in compensatory damages to the Gray family. It was the biggest ever jury award in U.S. product liability and personal injury cases. 
the judge reduced the punitive damages award from $125 million down to $3.5 million, which he later said was still larger than any other punitive damage award in the state by a factor of about five. Uh, so and in, 19, in 1981 dollars, that is about $125 million, right? In <laughs> yeah, today's I've, dollars? It was, uh, today's dollars. Okay. We need to like do like a sound effect for a today's dollars thing. <laughs> Usually um, Curtis will just do this in his head. So for those of you who are not math whizzes, uh, $3.5 million is just under $12 million today. I figured wow. that out in my head right now. Yeah, you did that super quick. Wow. That's crazy. Super fast. I know. You guys are so impressed. So that, that's sort of the summary. The facts are a lot more detailed. Now, this is an appeal to the Supreme Court of, the, of California. So you have the facts because it's a an appeal of a jury verdict and it was what's called a general verdict. This is a jury verdict. So the court of appeal supplies the facts that they interpreted from the court record in a manner that's most favorable to the outcome. If you've ever served on a jury, they don't ask you exactly what facts you relied upon or what evidence you relied upon. Even if you have a form where you have to check boxes and fill things out, it's usually just sort of thumbs up, thumbs down. Are, are, are they liable or are they not liable? So the facts here, the, the rule is when you appeal a case, the facts are construed in the light most favorable to uphold the jury verdict because the law policy is that we're going to assume that most jury verdicts are correct unless there's a legal error. So construed most favorably to the verdict, the facts were as follows. Part one, the exploding horsey, a.k.a. ball of fire. A 1972 Ford Pinto hatchback stalled on the freeway it was rear-ended by a Ford Galaxy proceeding in the same direction and then burst into flames. Lily Gray, who was the driver of the Pinto, had severe burns to her entire body and ultimately died as a result of congestive heart failure. 13-year-old Richard Grimshaw, who was a passenger, suffered severe, permanently disfiguring burns over his entire body. He underwent numerous skin grafts, extensive surgeries, and still lost portions of his fingers on his left hand and his left ear in the accident. They ex estimated that Grimshaw would require many more surgeries within the next 10 years. The plaintiff's expert testified that Pinto's gas tank was pushed forward upon impact and pun punctured by a flange or bolt on the differential housing. The fuel sprayed from the tank and entered the passenger compartment through the gaps between the rear wheel wells and the floor. In other words, if you imagine the, the bolts holding the bumper onto the rear end of the Ford Pinto, the gas tank was underneath the trunk, essentially, instead of over the wheels. And so when it was rear-ended, the bolts essentially punctured the, uh, the fuel tank, and that puncture caused the gas to come inside of the car and catch on fire and burn people. Not a great design. Part two, Ford's folly. The Pinto was a, an attempt to compete with the uh, onslaught of foreign, smaller, subcompact cars. So... They started designing a, a tiny car in 1968. Lee Iacocca, who is at the time the vice president at Ford, and I believe famous for designing the Ford Mustang, was the one who conceived of the Pinto. And um, he was its driving force. Basically said that the objective was to build a car that was at or below 2,000 pounds and sell for more, no more than $2,000. In today's dollars, it's just under $15,000 car. The courts described the Pinto as a rush project. And while the automotive industry, uh, the standard industry practice was that engineering studies precede the styling. In the case of the Pinto, the styling preceded the engineer and dictated <laughs> the engineering design to a greater degree than usual. And if you've seen a Ford Pinto, you know that style came first. In the <laughs> <laughs> Those are good looking cars. Beauty. The court found that the Pinto style required the gas tank to be placed behind the rear axle instead of over the rear axle, as was the preferred practice in Europe and Japan. And so the Ford only had about nine or 10 inches of crush space, which was far less than in any other American automobile or any other Ford overseas subcompact car. Ford's bumper was just little more than a chrome strips. 
less substantial than the bumper of any other American car produced then or later. The Ford Pinto's rear structure lacked reinforcement and found that in all, it, it was less reinforcement than all the ones that they made overseas, and it was less crush resistant than any other vehicle. And basically, the court found that there was a flange and a line of bolts in the differential housing, which were sufficient to puncture a gas tank driven forward upon rear impact. Crash test dummies. Ford tested two production models of the Pinto and prototypes, some of which were true duplicates of the design car to determine, among other things, whether the fuel system would be would remain intact in a rear end accident. So the proposed regulations that were there at the time required the impacts to have with to occur without significant fuel spillage in up to 20 miles per hour um, impacts in 1972 and then by 1973 in 30 miles per hour. Now, side note, the auto industry lobbied heavily against these uh, these regulations because they did not want to have to prevent fuel spillage in rear end impacts. All the crash tests that Ford did showed that Pinto failed all of the proposed regulations. A collision from the rear end, according to internal documents from Ford, typically caused the fuel tank to be driven forward and punctured, causing fuel leakage. The production Pinto typically caused the fuel neck to be torn from the gas tank and the tank to be punctured by a bolt head on the differential housing. In at least one test collision, spilled fuel had entered the driver's compartment through gaps, resulting from the separation of the seams, joining the rear wheel wells to the floor pan, which was a, due to a lack of reinforcement in the rear structure of the car. Secret internal documents at Ford showed that they crash tested the Pinto more than 40 times before it went in the market and the fuel tank ruptured in every test performed at speeds over 25 miles per hour. But Ford decided it's good enough for America and put it out there because those are some sexy cars. They tried all different kinds of prototypes. It failed every prototype. Um, and they tried different modifications to line the fuel tank with a rubber bladder, to locate the fuel tank uh, above rather than behind the rear axle, and to add reinforcement. You can have it fast, you can have it cheap, or you can have it good, but you can't have all three. Key to the case here was the court's finding that the cost of these reinforcements was extremely inexpensive. It wouldn't have cost them much at all. But Ford went ahead and designed, produced and sold the Pinto without doing anything to rem remedy the defects. The design changes that could have remedied this defect, again, exploding cars, could have been as follows. Longitudinal side members for a cost of $2.40 each. Cross members for a cost of $1.80 each. A shock absorbing flax suit for the fuel tank, $4.00 tank within a tank and placement of the tank over the rear axle, $5 to $5.79. A nylon bladder within the tank, $5.25 to about $8. Placement of the tank over the rear axle with a protective barrier, $9.95. Substitution of a rear axle with a smooth differential housing, $2.10. A protective shield between the differential housing and fuel tank, $2.35. Improvement and reinforcement of the rear bumper, $2.60, or an additional eight inches of crush space, $6.40. So had Ford just put a reinforced rear structure, a smooth axle, a better bumper, and additional crush space, it would have cost $15.30 per car to make the fuel tank safe in a 34 to 38 mile per hour rear end collision by a vehicle the size of the Ford Galaxy. If they had also added a bladder or a tank within a tank, it would have been safe in a 40 to 45 mile per hour rear impact. And if the tank had been located over the rear axle, it would have been safe in a rear impact of over 50 miles per hour or more. Next chapter, they knew. The Pinto project <laughs> team had all kinds of product review meetings that were chaired and attended by none other than Mr. Lee Iacocca. The Pinto was approved by Ford's product planning committee, which included Lee Iacocca and other Ford vice presidents. In fact, at an April 1971 product review meeting, a report prepared by the engineers, nerd alert, entitled Fuel System Integrity Program Financial Review, boring, was distributed and discussed, which referred to the crash tests of the Ford vehicles 
and estimated the financial impact of design changes to comply with the proposed regulations. The report recommended deferring the fixes in order to accrue cost savings. Harley Kopp, a former Ford engineer and the executive in charge of the crash test system, uh, crash test proing, testified at the highest member of at the highest level of Ford's management made the decision to go forward with the production of the Pinto, knowing the gas tank was vulnerable to puncture and rupture at low rear impact speeds, creating a significant risk of death or injury from fire, knowing that fixes were feasible at a nominal cost. Not good. <laughs> oh, so you can imagine why the why the jury soaked them. <laughs> I just I'm like, in dis- I just wow. I cannot yeah. like every it's like getting worse and worse. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I mean, it, this is the same time that they're marketing cigarettes to kids, you know, but um, well. Lee Iacocca was famous for saying safety doesn't sell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Again, safety doesn't sell. Not here. Not here. Not nowhere. Not a change. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, tell that to Volvo, right? Dumb Swedes, huh? Um, <laughs> So after the uh, Ford got hit with $125 million of punitive damages and then reduced down to $3.5 million, which was, again, like $12 million for two plaintiffs, they appealed. The Court of Appeal upheld. It went to the California Supreme Court on a variety of legal issues. And the question was, was the award of punitive damages proper under many different theories of law argued by very expensive attorneys? So what are punitive damages? This is where Kristen's gonna gonna take over and give us the law stuff, right? No, I mean, I honestly, I'm saving it all for comedy court, which I, I'm I'm working on my arguments <laughs> yeah. as we speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. All right. So the idea of punitive damages is a policy that even in a civil suit, not a criminal suit, that we need to punish and deter some kind of conduct that is so egregious, um, so. Uh, above and beyond that even that even the compensatory damages aren't enough. So the last couple of episodes, if you've been listening, have been dealing with the concept of remedies. The general principle of remedies, if you've already listened to the last five episodes, you can skip ahead about a minute. But if you haven't, listen up. The idea of a remedy is to put the plaintiff in the same position they would have been if the accident had never happened. So If you're talking about just property damage, for example, and you've got a car that's worth $10,000 and your car gets totaled, in other words, the damage is more than it would cost to repair, then your damages would be $10,000, the value of the thing you lost. And so all the damages that we talked about, about compensatory damages, those losses were intended to put the plaintiffs in the position they would have been had they not been injured by the faulty product, the Ford Pinto or burning ball of fire. Those are, those are the things that we estimate fixes or puts them back where they are. Now there's ideas like emotional distress and pain and suffering, which are hard to value, but essentially we try and put a dollar value on, on all of those things. So your, your medical expenses, what it's going to cost for future medical expenses, like a 13 year old Richard Grimshaw, who's going to need 10 years of skin grafts and surgeries, like all of those costs are to be borne by the defendant if they're liable to try to put the plaintiff where they would have been if they hadn't been injured. And all we can do is money. We can't give people their fingers back. Okay. So sorry. Was that too gruesome? That was kind of gruesome. (laughs) We're going to need a palate cleanser after this case. The idea of punitive damages is something different. Okay. It's not aimed to put the plaintiff back in the position they were. It's not aimed to fix what was done wrong to the plaintiff. It's focused on the defendant's conduct and what the law says and the, the, there's a statute in California that permits awards of punitive damages in certain cases. What the statute says is that when the plaintiff causes intentional harm, commits fraud, is malicious, or is oppressive, we will award punitive damages to punish and deter that bad conduct. Even though it's not a criminal case, we're going to award even more money and we're going to enrich the plaintiff even more. We're going to put them in a better position than they would have been because defendant, you are bad. What you did was bad. And we think that we're going to, you're going to have to pay a penalty. Okay. So punitive, literally punish. Now in the case of Ford, did they intend for people to die in fireball rear end accidents? 
I mean, not really intentional, but they didn't care. They didn't care if it would happen. And so that's a different version of intent. It's reckless disregard for human health and safety, which we call malice. So they just didn't care who got hurt. There's reckless disregard, not, not intending that someone get hurt necessarily. It just I D B G A S that's texting acronym right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing too, that we do is we require a higher burden of proof on punitive damages. So in a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. In a civil case, it's typically a preponderance of the evidence or 50% plus a feather, just a little bit more likely than not that the defendant's liable. In the case of punitive damages, the standard is something in between called clear and convincing evidence. You need really strong evidence if you're going to punish somebody. And so in this case, Ford was found by clear and convincing evidence to have acted with reckless disregard for human health and safety. And so the question is, could they be liable? Ford said they couldn't be liable. Anyone want to guess what the California Supreme Court guessed? Was the award of punitive damages proper? Well, according to the California Supreme Court, the answer is, fuck yeah, come on. Those guys are assholes. <laughs> so the judgment was affirmed and reduced because it was reasonable and not excessive. What we look at in terms of of an excessive punitive damages award is one that exceeds 10% of the net worth of the uh, of the defendant. So there's a whole line of cases finding that analyze what how, how do you calculate a punitive damages award? Because it's just supposed to punish. And so the Cal the United States Supreme Court has determined that up to 10% of the defendant's net worth is a proper punitive damages award. Or you can measure it at a rate of 10 times the compensatory damages award. So 10x, whatever the compensatory damages are. So if you have your $10,000 automobile that is destroyed and it's a punitive damages, they did it on, on purpose, they threw a Molotov cocktail in your front window, then the punitive damages could be 10 times that, so $100,000, so long as the defendant has a million dollars or could be reduced by a percentage if the defendant doesn't have that much money. And so here, $3.5 million was a drop in the bucket for Ford. There's a little twist, and I don't think we need to necessarily get into it for, for our case, but the statute did not allow punitive damages in the case of a wrongful death action. Remember that the driver died, Grimshaw survived. And so in a wrongful death action, the, um, the plaintiff is the estate of the, or the family members of the, uh, of the person who passed away. So the court upheld the denial of an award of punitive damages to the heirs of Lily Gray, the driver of the car, as not unconstitutional and not a violation, not a violation of the California Constitution Equal Protection Clause, which guarantees equal treatment under the law. It's an interesting technicality, not really something we want to get into at this level. So that is what happens when you design a bad car. That <laughs> well said. Uh huh. Questions? Have you ever owned a Ford Pinto before? Uh, several. It's all I drive. Well, uh, my my roommate and my good friend, um, we were just talking about Pintos, and I was like, "My God, like who would would have it?" And he got oddly defensive of the Pinto, and I'm like, well, "Why are you defending the Pinto?" And he said, "My uncle had one, and it was a good car." I don't know. I just thought that was interesting because I've never heard someone defend it in any way <laughs> or or admit to having one well you know it, it, when you have cars that fail in a dramatic and fiery way uh, it can <laughs> you know create controversy both sides you know both sides definitely uh definitely affects the retail the resale value mm -hmm. this does kind of remind me of teslas the batteries would blow up mm -hmm. when they I feel like when they first came out and there were all these videos that went viral of just a tesla on fire in some nice neighborhood and uh, I feel like they squashed it because now Teslas are so popular. Whatever PR they did or however they fixed it, they must have done well, a good I job. Think, I think keyword <clears throat> is they fixed it. Yeah, I, yeah, probably. Well, yeah, that's, didn't they buy they Twitter? Chose... That's a question, which they fixed Twitter too. Oh, it's so much better now. That's a question <laughs> is, did they continue making Ford Pintos and make these adjustments or did they just stop making them altogether? 
Uh, there was a massive recall. All one point five million of the Pintos and it ended up getting um recalled in nineteen seventy eight. There was a the National Highway Tra- Traffic Safety Administration um did an investigation and basically just just destroyed the Pinto as well as the um, Mercury Bobcat. My Sorry. father owned a Mercury Bobcat and it was an amazing <laughs> car, really. Okay. <laughs> um also the um the General Motors recalled 320,000 of its 1976 and 1977 Chevettes for similar fuel tank modifications. Okay, but my dad really did have a Chevette. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah. Um, we could have died in that car. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think that uh, if we're honest with ourselves, you can die in pretty much any car. Just yeah. Say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, Ford, this is obviously a public relations embarrassment. Uh, you know, it's they had a little egg on their face. But a, a lot of the cars were like that in the late 70s because than, they were trying to compete with the fire. cheaply made foreign imports. Um, and, you know, the if we remember the Carter administration and fuel lines and, and kind of the, the economic context of the time. And, you know, they're trying to make a affordable entry level automobile for people. So, you know, there is some value engineering, but maybe the explosion part isn't the place to value engineer. <laughs> I mean, also, let's be fair. They were truest. They're aesthetes. You know, they really valued like the style lines, you know, and I think that's something we should really commend them for. Is yeah. Really sticking to their guys yeah. on that. Mm-hmm. Form over function. Uh, that's right. Yeah. This is art. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> the, coup d'etat, the coup d'etat, though, is this. The radio spots for the Ford Pinto included the following line. Pinto leaves you with that warm feeling. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Because you're on fire. <laughs> wow. Not a good coincidence. The advertising oh, agency gosh. did end up trimming that out of the out did of they? the car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How long was the Pinto on the market then? Like eight years that they were around before eight, it got five recalled? years, nineteen seventy one to nineteen seventy six. Okay, but they but they finally made the recall you said in seventy eight. Yeah, nineteen seventy eight. What does what does a recall mean? Does that mean that like like so recently our air fryer was recalled? We saw something on KTLA about it, and then I bought it on Amazon for my sister, and Amazon sent me a message saying one of the items you bought has been recalled, and I was like, well, what am what do I do? You just stop using it. You don't get no. Like, you're supposed to send it in for fixes. Mm-hmm. So um, it yeah. didn't list that option at all. It just said like use at your own risk kind of thing. It's like okay, <laughs> what? No, the idea of yeah. a recall is literally they're calling it back. So like if it's your car, I mean these days if it's in your car, it'll just drive itself back to the you know mm-hmm. dealership or whatever. But yeah, that that like you you'll take in your if you take in your car to the dealership, they'll be like yeah you know there's a, like a there's a clip we need to replace. It's, you know, causing the entire thing to melt. We're going to need to fix mm-hmm. that. But no, literally a recall is like, it's supposed to go back to the manufacturer for them to, to, you know, change whatever it is that's defective. Um, so yeah, you better like do it. something about the air fryers. Um, I, my Spencer got burned by an air fryer. Uh, not, not terribly, but uh, enough that it was, uh, enough that it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> The thing and is, it depends on who's laughing. It could have been funny anyway. You know what I mean? He like, kept all of his fingers. Let's yeah, put it that's, that way. That's good. Lucky guy. Mm-hmm. But the I thing think. is, like, once then things been recalled, if you keep using it without, like, sending it back for fixes, then you're using it at your own risk. And you can. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Amazon should have. Maybe you need to contact the manufacturer. Mm. It should be yeah. like everything should be covered, like the cost of shipping of everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a public service announcement. It's probably because Amazon is a third-party reseller, so they that's probably yeah. why they aren't offering it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, you know, when you open up and there's all that packaging, can you buy something? There's all that packaging and those warnings. I don't know what it says. You just throw it away. But usually what it says is don't take it back to Bed Bath & Beyond or Linens and Things or whatever other bankrupt retailer you bought it from. Just, uh, you know, send it back to the manufacturer if you can find them. So, um. The question is whether whether the punitive damages was enough, really, because if you consider the number of Ford Pintos that were made, about one and a half million, so it would have been $2 to $12 per car 
to make the changes or up to $15.80, um, you know, or maybe even $20 a car. So if it's uh, 1.5 million cars, you're talking about $20, $30 million. One study showed that there were about 180 deaths in Ford Pintos and about 180 serious burn injuries. So if it had redesigned all the Pintos in the first place to prevent all of those injuries, their expenses could have been into the hundreds of millions of dollars. However, all of the personal injury claims, including all punitive damages claims that they got all together was about $50 million. So Ford, in its uh, economic rationality, had valued a human life at about $207,750 to arrive at a cost-benefit analysis. That's like how much the air fryer was. <laughs> <laughs> this has been, obviously, the, the Grimshaw case has been it's taught in law schools. It's one that's a source of a lot of discussion. Um, UCLA professor Gary Schwartz wrote a, a law review article in 1990 uh, basically saying that the jury verdict was plausible and that the core of the story was essentially that um, it would have effectively been about $9. Because remember, when the opinion was written by the Court of Appeal, they looked at the entire trial record, okay? They looked at every piece of evidence evidence that comes in, both for and against the ultimate outcome. So we're we're reciting these facts that were in the ultimate opinion but every inference, every fact, every piece of evidence is taken in the manner most favorable to the plaintiff because the plaintiff won. We don't know what the jury was actually thinking, what they, how they actually reached their decision. But this, there's this rule that when you appeal your case, they're going to look at every piece of evidence favorably to the plaintiffs. So there could have been more than one inference possible. There could have been, there could have been mitigating evidence. Um, some of the evidence may have been viewed in a way that would be more balanced. The way the story I told you was the plaintiff's story because they won. So if you take that, there's some who, who have argued that the Pinto decision was actually an overreaction and that the economic concerns, there were other economic concerns, right? Making an affordable car, making a car that looked good, that would sell well, that would be able to compete in the marketplace and that the, the safety considerations they weren't quite so bad that there was, you know, they were looking at all different kinds of design features and they figured that it wasn't going to be that bad. And most of the injuries and impacts weren't going to be, weren't going to result in that kind of a horrific outcome or be very infrequent. I'm, I'm, I feel like how much of this should I save for comedy court? Because I really, I've got this all lined up, but I mean, in reality, if it was like such a death trap and so like un, like unsupportable as a car, wasn't there some federal role, right? Like for somebody to like, say, hey, you can't put a car out with these, like don't meet these minimum standards, you know? Why do we right. want these private companies to be deciding what is safe enough in the first place? Right, and re remember that um, these were proposed safety standards mm -hmm. regarding the rear end collisions in the early 70s, you know, resistance to accidents at 20 or 30 miles an hour. And so you know, there is this cost benefit analysis in the crash test and, you know, how how much crash should it, be able to withstand, I mean, the way they make cars now that pretty much you get rear-ended, your car is going to be trashed, but you're going to be all right because safety has come a really long way since the, you know, when was the seatbelt invented? Sometime in the seventies, I think, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, cars were, you know, pretty dangerous at that point in time. And so we're, we're applying some hindsight bias here. You know, now we're just like, oh yeah, battery catches on fire. You're going to be fine. Got a built-in, you know, fire extinguisher or whatever, <laughs> but there's an interesting twist here. If you look at the defense evidence, Ford argued that the approaching car, the Ford Galaxy, hadn't even slowed down when it rear-ended the Pinto. And it hit the car in excess of 50 miles an hour. And so there was, there was a ton of evidence at trial, which was a, a, you know, a dispute about how fast the car was coming when it rear-ended the, the Pinto. And so 50 miles an hour, you know, being able to withstand a rear end collision, if, even at 50 miles an hour was well above any of the safety standards, well above any expectation. You know, we're talking about 20 to 30 mile an hour collisions versus 50 miles an hour collision. Ford basically was saying this driver didn't even tap the brakes. And so we couldn't have, no matter what we would have done, no matter how much money we would have spent, we couldn't have protected the plaintiff. We couldn't have protected 
um, these these folks uh, with the tech, existing technology and built the same car because it's just there were no regulations that would have required us to do that at that kind of speed. There was no technology that could have prevented that kind of injury. And if the jury had accepted what Ford said the crash speed was, there wouldn't really have been a question. Not even the best cars on the road at the time could have withstood a 50 mile an hour rear end collision. And so I guess it shows that the winners make the rules. It's also how we got seat belts was basically then just like over and over again, car companies were losing in court. So you just got mm -hmm. sick of losing. So yeah, it's just kind of a sad, sad indictment against like sort of our own like system of, of maintaining like people's bodily integrity. If we just sort of like let it be like a guess and sue system, right? Like, oops, sorry, like lawsuit. Okay, now we'll change it, you know, sort of right. not very proactive. Right. Well, you know, if you look at the the train derailment in in Ohio and that the increased mm -hmm. incidence of train derailments, a lot of it has to do with failure of the regulatory system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's an interesting policy argument about how much re regulation is possible. And Ford and the other car companies didn't want high crash test standards because it would have made the cars more expensive. It would have hurt their sales ultimately. And, you know, there's actually a, a public argument that if you make cars into tanks, essentially, they become unaffordable for people. So would you rather have a car that explodes once in a while or would you rather have no car at all? Those aren't good choices. <laughs> <laughs> They're not good choices. <laughs> My bike doesn't explode. <laughs> oh, well, don't even get me. Don't even get me into bicycles. Um, those uh, is dangerous. <laughs> well, in Los Angeles, I get, bike injury accidents are, you know, you're a lot smaller than a car. Well, then All of right. course, there's also, you know, whether or not these these bikers slash uh, car drivers know that they're in for trouble, like mm -hmm. that's just likely to be dangerous. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, free advice to job seekers, rentahitman.com is a parody site. It doesn't actually provide hitman services, although according to its founder, at least 30 people have been arrested because they thought it did. You should not send in your resume if you're seeking employment as a hitman. Someone did this month. <laughs> <laughs> Traffic court advice. The get out of jail free card from Monopoly has no binding legal effect, at least in Minnesota. A driver tried in March, didn't actually believe it did. The Chisago County Sheriff's Office said the driver got points for the effort and humor, but he probably also got a ticket. Oh, that's so smart. I hope they pay the ticket of Monopoly money. <laughs> <laughs> a shout out to loweringthebar.com by Kevin Underhill for diligently collecting legal humor from around the internet. All right, folks, so that's our palate cleanser. When we get back, we're gonna do some comedy court. And we're back. Welcome to Comedy Court. Please call the case. Uh, we have uh, Grimshaw against Ford. Uh, case number blah, blah, blah. That's a that's a technical numbering system in uh, Comedy Court. We had uh, case number whoopsing earlier this morning. Case blah, blah, blah. Go ahead. Uh, Your Honor, as, as the attorney for the... Uh great and mighty and American institution of Ford, uh, which I would just like to say, basically invented the modern production line and is, and its founder is a hero of American folklore. Uh, this company has been known to be innovators, uh, you know, since their inception. They are also people who are very concerned with the wallets of the American man. That's why the Model T was so affordable, right? Think about it, right? Uh, because we care at Ford about making things cost efficient. That meant that they were mavericks. They took a they took a chance. They gambled to make sure that we Americans could drive ourselves to work in a stylish car. And that's the Pinto for you. So the fact that they would be punished for being willing to step outside of the box and give the American people what they want, which clearly is the Pinto, is to me, it's an affront. And might I add, let's really, let's get down to it. Were they even really liable? Were they malicious? I don't think they were malicious. It's a weird thing to construct the term malicious to include reckless indifferent, which seems to me to be two separate things. And I'll say this, unjust enrichment. That's my other point. These people bought a very cheap car and now they're gonna be multimillionaires. It seems like, whoa, if I knew that I could be possibly benefiting well beyond the, I mean, they could basically 
own the entire Pinto production line if they want to do it at this point because they're that rich. That's ridiculous. So yeah, of course they would have to like limit the liability, but there should have been no punitive award. I just want to say that none, especially not for somebody who's not even alive. How are they going to enjoy it? They're not going to enjoy it. So those are my, my brief arguments. I'll wait for rebuttal to get into the really good stuff. <clears throat> and your response? I, uh, God, you know, I'm almost at a loss for words. I've been practicing law for <clears throat> Six weeks now, and I have not come upon a case this horrific. Okay, <clears throat> my client's Richard Grimshaw. Three point five million dollars is nothing, guys. Okay, three point five million dollars. I could spend that in a weekend. Okay, three point five million dollars in ten years is going to be two hundred fifty k. Ten years after that, it's going to be fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. Inflation's going through the roof, guys. That's not much. In six sir, months, it's going to be. Sir. I'm sorry. I'm a math guy. I'm I, a math I guy. Suggest, I suggest you you stop calling the court guys. 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 <laughs> Please address me as your honor, as Judge uh, Felicia Huxtable. As... Okay. <laughs> My apologies, uh you're honorous. Um, Thank you. Uh, it looks like you're wearing a fake mustache. So I did think that you were a man. I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> it clashes with the suit, with the suit. I apologize. You're honorous. <clears throat> By the way, six weeks is how long I've been practicing. I'm not bad, right? For a lawyer that's only practicing for six I, weeks. I'm still I, getting I used to a lot of the not terminal. Bad. Not bad. Thank you. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we could hang out after this. You seem like a nice person. Objection. <laughs> <clears throat> carry on, carry on. Okay. <clears throat> uh, where was Okay. My yeah. other client, Lily Gray, you know, she's no longer with us. Okay. It's a tragedy that she died in this accident. Her family will never be made whole. $650,000 is, is a drop in the bucket for this Ford, Ford Motor Company. Okay. And my father, my father drove a Ford, okay? And he defended it to his dying day. His last word was buy Ford, okay? I come from a Ford family. I grew up in Detroit. All we drove were, were Fords, okay? But after this case, taking on this case, I, I, I'd say no one should be driving these cars. They're like, they're like uh, rolling Molotov cocktails. And the fact that my clients only got this much makes me sick to my stomach. My fees are almost this much, okay? That's all I got for now. May I, may I uh, submit a rebuttal? <clears throat> you may. Please keep it brief. Okay. I would just like to say that if, if it's such a rolling Molotov cocktail, then perhaps it is the U.S. government that ought to be paying Lily because they're the ones who are responsible for regulating safety, not the innocent uh, corporate mavericks that over there at Ford Company who are just every day sitting around with, like rubbing themselves with the American flag and, and <laughs> thanking their lucky stars that they um, can, can be such champions uh, to the working man. Okay, that's what they're doing over there. They're not the ones who are supposed to be worrying about like the safety issues. That's, that's, the, that's the government's job. That's a regulatory issue. And also, might I add this to the following thing? That person who was driving the Galaxy was probably like a, some sort of hippie listening to some sort of, of subversive rock music that if you played backwards would say like satanic things. And probably what I will even say was maybe under the influence of marijuana at the time that they rammed into that person at 50 miles an hour. So I say punitive damages, totally unfair. And also might I add, there's no claim preclusion. Another person could sue over this Pinto and also try and take Ford for even more of their hardworking American working man money. And that would be a horrible, horrible tragedy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I breathe? Can we do advertisements? <laughs> Real quick. I, can I'll, I just I'll say? Allow, I'll this, allow it. I'll allow it. Okay. This has nothing to do with this case. Bloody blah. Um, if anyone does want to want to sue for, I am willing to to represent them. My fees are a little steep, but I get the job. And you guys seeing how, how well my suit looks. I'm a pretty good lawyer. So if anyone's sitting in the audience or jury. Okay. Okay. Pretty good lawyer. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you, have, um, do you have anything further to add to the arguments? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, do I think the American government, our wonderful American government, should be uh, regulating these cars? Yes, I do. Okay. But there's something called self-regulation. Okay. In the 12th Amendment, the 11th, 11th Amendment was each citizen has the the prior restraint to self-govern in their own responsible way. Okay, guys? And that corporations being people, that goes to corporations too. Okay? So this corporation, the Ford Corporation, they're held responsible for their car. If this car explodes, you know, yeah, the government should have to do something about it, but they're a responsible party, in my opinion. And I'd say my opinion is correct. Hmm. Judge? I do I, uh, all the arguments in. Okay, one more. When you buy a car, you know that you're not buying a, a soft, fluffy pony that's not going to ever explode on you. You know there's a possibility. So you assume the risk. Okay, now I'm done. These are closing arguments? Is that what we're doing right now? That's, yeah. Okay. Excuse me. I just want to interrupt these proceedings. I'm uh, I'm here from Mother Jones magazine in the future, and we've actually researched. And um, uh, I heard somebody say there were 180 burn deaths. It's actually incorrect. That's a low estimate. In fact, based on our research in the year 2023, traveling back in time to this argument in 1981, we can tell you that there have been between 500 and 900 burn deaths due to the Pinto crashes. Just a little bit of information for your honor to consider. Although it would have made the cars more expensive. Thank you for joining us, future boy. Oh, you're welcome. The court has, the court has heard your opinion. So I'm taking it into consideration. Also, they're really <laughs> cool looking. Yes. Put that on the record. They are extremely stylish. <clears throat> Noted to the record, extremely stylish and cool looking. Well, if there is no more to say, uh, I have come to a decision. Oh, uh, can I just yeah. say, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to say before you give your decision, I don't want to affect your opinion whatsoever. But now you took off the fake mustache. Uh, you look exactly like Elizabeth Taylor. It, it's incredible. Attention. You are a, <laughs> You are a very attractive woman. And I'm not saying that that's that's the only yardstick for measuring sir, someone's sir, sir, if I didn't get that comment every day, I would think that you were trying to sway my opinion. <laughs> right. However, I do look exactly like Elizabeth Taylor. So thank you for pointing that out. As I said, I've come to a conclusion. <clears throat> I find the Ford company not liable. Yes. Oh, I, however, find the Ford company guilty as well. Okay. So oh. my judgment <laughs> is the Ford company not liable. However, guilty as, please excuse the court's language, guilty as hell. I think we're oh. willing to accept that. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <clears throat> that's an outcome. Will right. I still be being paid? No, you will be spending uh, the afternoon <clears throat> in a jail cell as I'm now <laughs> holding you in contempt of court. <laughs> oh, God. oh no. Well, I didn't have plans anyways, but it's still an inconvenience. I got to call my mom. She's supposed to come pick me up. Sir. Yes. This has been comedy court. <laughs> and now we'll get a word with the advocates. Um, uh, Ford, you're um, a lawyer for Ford. I don't know your name. Uh, you uh, yeah. <laughs> fabulous job there. Your your client is guilty, but not liable and um, guilty as hell. A new legal term. Well, what do you have to say for the viewers at home? I would say that the uh, ama amazing American heroes over at the Ford Motor Company are satisfied with the outcome today. I don't think that we as a corporation admit to having souls, so we do not have, feel any crisis of conscience about our our imputed guilt 
so long as it doesn't affect our bottom line, you'll keep seeing the fabulous cars like the Pinto that keep rolling off the assembly line every day over at the Ford Motor Company. Thank you so much. We're going to have to leave it there because I see the the attorney for the plaintiffs uh, chasing in handcuffs, headed back to jail. Uh, great <sighs> advocacy today, for, you know, throwing flattery at the judge, noting that uh, she is uh, strikingly similar to Elizabeth Taylor. Um, how do you feel yeah. about today's uh, ruling? I, I tell you what, I don't feel good about it. This keeps happening. I keep coming up, showing up to court. I try my best to advocate for my clients, and each time I end up in jail, I don't know what it is. I, uh, God, I need. I think I need to read a little bit more law stuff. I feel so bad because I feel like I've really let down my clients. But you know what? <sighs> another day, another dollar. Am I right? Oh, and so, here uh, comes the bailiff. So sorry to have to cut this short. This has been Comedy Court. I am uh, the reporter for Mother Jones in 2023, traveling back in time to report on this particular episode, as well as also being the bailiff at the beginning, in case you didn't recognize my voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take another quick break. When we come back, we'll do some improv. And we're back. Boys, 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 <clears throat> we are going to build a car. We're not going to just build a car. We're going to build a sex machine. The sexiest, hottest sex pistol car on the market. 1981. Boom! 19 oh, wow. The 1981 <laughs> phallus. Everybody's going to love the 1981 phallus. They're going to want to jump in and ride. I love it. It's going to it sell millions. Finally, we can compete with those sexy cars from Japan. You know, that, that's what we need to do. That's what we do. Some American muscle. This yeah. car is going to be on fire. Hot, sexy, and very hot. Maria. No? Oh, I can, I can see it now. Uh, how about this? The Ford Phallus, okay? And it's going to be such a hot, sexy car. We'll put a water bed right above the fuel tank in the back seat. I love it. About that? I love it. I love it. I love it. This is great. So uh, what else can we put in there besides that water bed? Well, I think we need some uh, we need some kind of like a disco ball in the center so people can, you know, you know, do their cocaine and dance disco in the back seat before jumping on the water bed. Cocaine. Mm. Yes. Heard that. <laughs> What about this? Uh, right next to the engine compartments, that it's warmed up by the heat of the engine. Some lube, some strawberry flavored lube. Oh, mm -hmm. a warming lube machine. Oil, oil based, of course. Yes. Well, would have to be yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would be like directly that attached to the gas tank, correct? Yes. Or... Yeah. Just Brilliant as long as it gets too. warmed up by the engine. Yeah. Yes. Ooh. What about if we made the steering wheel like shaped like a pair of boobies? No, oh, you just yes. gotta just hold the boobies, oh, like it. Well, yeah. it. and then for the ladies, and then for the ladies, you know, just a, like a nice, like a little, like a little, just a, a scrotum. Like a they can just grab the scrotum and just drive the scrotum down the road. What about that gear shift? Hmm? There you yeah. go, gear yeah. shift. I like yes, that. Yeah, now we're talking. This thing's gonna sell like hotcakes. Mm -hmm. But can we make it for under a thousand dollars? Is what I want to know. A thousand dollars? I only want to spend five hundred and seventy-seven dollars and sixty-nine cents per how, car. How about we make it so that you can only go in and the doors don't let you out? <laughs> that, that sounds brilliant. And then you're in the car great idea. all the time. What if we got rid of one of the wheels and just had two in the back and one in the front so that it was like a tricycle? We could save one quarter of the of the act. We would only need one axle, first of all. Second of all, we would only need three tires. Ooh, saving how about hundreds this? of dollars. Instead of uh, inflatable airbags, there are condoms that, that blow up from the wheel. Well. What's an airbag? Where are those airbags? <laughs> What's a condom? What could that be? <laughs> All right, but you got me. So many things today. I am an executive from the future. That's like I've when... traveled to the past. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> it's not like boy. one of those kind of newfangled, like seatbelts made out of some kind of a hot air balloon or something of that nature. Hachi machi. Now you're talking, kid. 
What about if we fill the inside with, you know, with like those big plastic balls like the children jump into? Then that would be kind of like an airbag. If the water bed in the front and the big bin of plastic balls in the front. And the, the airbag, it catches air, right? I mean, that's what you do with it. It's an airbag. I, so like, I just want to say. Else inside? I just want to say this past weekend, I spent a lot of time at Chuck E. Cheese's. <laughs> Those balls are dangerous, man. I got stuck in one of those ball pits. I don't know if we should be messing with those. I was in there for two hours. Two hours? <laughs> yeah, I almost drowned. I, I told people, I think I'm drowning. And they said, sir, you're not allowed in here. I, I don't know what the... You can't drown. There's no water. I, I said, I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Two hours. Luckily, they closed and they take out all the balls and hose them down. So I survived, luckily. Anyways, I like all the ideas besides that. I, that seems too dangerous. Very jarring for you. A terrible, terrible time. Noted, noted uh, uh, Bob over here does not like balls in his face. Uh, no, 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 no. Happy birthday, Timmy. Thanks for inviting me to Chuck E. Cheese party for your birthday. Why is your dad over there in the ball tank? I mean, these like, balls are. It keeps, keeps saying, "Help me, help me, something," and I'm, I'm not really sure. I can't really hear him. Oh, it's cool. Uh, hey, do you want to do you want to play tag? Just you're it. What? No fair. Yeah, you're, you're it. it. You're it. Oh, I'm it. Okay. Excuse me, sir. You're not allowed to be in the children's ball pit. I'd have hey, to. Hey, hey. Miss, I'd love to get out of this ball, but I can't. I'm drowning in here. I can't get out of here. I came in here to get my wallet. I, my wallet fell out of my pants. I was trying to pay for some tickets. And so I, honestly, the balls are pretty fun, too. But I, 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 I feel like I'm drowning in here. I, please, just give me a hat. Sir, the ball pit is approximately two feet deep. Uh, I know. I, I'm not a strong swimmer. If you just throw me an inner tube or something, do you have Chuck E. Cheese inner tubes here? I am not a licensed lifeguard or safety professional and cannot extend any sort of aid that might incur some sort of liability should I fail to perform that duty to a certain standard of, uh, of care. So. Oh, God. What a way to die. I can see my old picture right now. Daddy, Daddy, I'll save you. Jimmy, no, 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 it's too oh, dangerous. Jimmy, oh, no, Jimmy. Oh, God. Jimmy, somebody. Well, I'll be a Chuck E. Cheese employee. Chuck E. Cheese employee. My friend Timmy's in the ball tank. Somebody's got to do something. Please, no. Also, he's bad Bob. I mean, no one, I feel like I've been here for an hour and a half. No one's giving me any attention. Please note the limitation of liability language posted right next to the ball pit. Chuck E. Cheese uh, uh, discloses expressly any liability incurred from accidental aspiration or asphyxiation in the ball pit. Have a pleasant afternoon and happy birthday, Timmy. Damn. I'm going to sue them for all the tickets in this place. Ah. That, are we going to make it, Dad? Are we going to make it? Just, here, hold on to me. We'll get out of here. Oh, God. <laughs> Your mother was right. She was right to leave me. <laughs> oh, oh God, don't say that. Home. Not when we're going to die in here. We're not going to die. T Timmy, look at me. We're not going to die. Oh, God. Here, maybe we can reach that stuffed animal right there, that big panda bear. I'm trying. I'm really trying, Dad. I'm trying. Here, I'm going to... I got I it. I got it. Look. I'm Peppy Panda. Let me help you out of the ball pit. Here, oh, I'll lift you, Timmy. Happy, happy birthday, Timmy. Wow, thank you. I'm one of the lesser-known Chuck E. Cheese characters, Peppy Panda. People don't notice me because I hang out here in the ball pit all day long until somebody drowns. Your dad's been <laughs> in here a long time. Let me... <laughs> It's been an hour and a half, pal. I thought you were a stuffed animal. Why didn't you do anything? Well, to be honest, I was having a good time watching you play with the kiddos. It gets a little boring down here, and, uh, you know, it's always nice to have another adult. Okay, cut to his, his interview.
Hey, so you're going to be uh, playing uh, the panda bear. I don't know. The Honestly, like everyone gets a job at Chuck E. Cheese as they want to play Chuck E. Cheese, the mouse. Okay. But you need to work here for at least eight years before you play the mouse. Honestly, I saw your audition tape. I just don't think you're ready. So we're going to put you in the panda suit. Okay. And your jurisdiction is going to be the ball pit. You know, Have you I been in a... I, I studied at Juilliard. We yeah. see that, yeah, but uh, with Wuda Hagen. Listen, uh, you just don't well, have. I have three Tonys, but you don't have pizzazz. Okay, I didn't want to have to say right. that. Okay, that's why I hired Griffin to say these things to you. You got yeah, no pizzazz, I, kid. None. I come in to break hard news to people, and <sighs> I just don't see the pizzazz. I don't understand. The, Take a look the, the out this window. The reporter called Take a look my performance. The, but the but the all the press said that my performance in the Iceman Cometh was interesting. Yeah, we don't really read Mother Jones. Uh, uh, we don't see this. Knock knock. I'm sorry if I'm early, but uh, I believe I have an addition for the part of Chuck E. Cheese. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, I've got no experience, but my father is a executive at uh warner brothers just you are hired my dear beautiful really i'm good loving stuff. the pizzazz You're like Thank look at this so sparkle and shine shingity dingity i will Ooze warn you that i will not leave a fit like lift a finger to save the lives of any children imperiled in that ball pit no kid no chuck no no e. no, no, no. Chuck, that's that's the panda's job not chuck e cheese okay okay I, I see how this works. I, that's all I can say is I see how this works. I mean, could you at least make me some kind of lesser known character? I can, I can do a lot. There are no small parts, only small actors. Oof, maybe Ronnie the Rat. You think this kid could be Ronnie the Rat? I don't know. I mean, he's whiny probably, enough. Probably, probably uh, Pretty Pizza Sally. He could be. Ooh, see, I don't think he. Uh... Yeah, I don't think this kid can dance. I don't think this kid can dance. I, th I think he can do the piano the, the way that she does it. You play piano, kid? <clears throat> I mean, uh, two years of lessons. He doesn't play the piano. This is a panda. I'm telling you, we're looking think, right at the at the ball pit panda. This is panda. Well, yeah. all right, all right, all right. Okay. Listen, I, listen. I need the work, so let me just let me let me give it my let me give it a go. Well, hi, kids. I'm Peppy Panda. I'm just uh, here to tell you about a good time, and uh, yeah, maybe um, let's have some fun with our good old pal Chuck E. Cheese. What do you say, folks? We'll uh, we'll uh, we're gonna we're gonna spend all of our tickets, and we're gonna go down to the river and uh, swim in it. And happy birthday! Yeah, Mom, why happy is that birthday? Well, why is that bear black and white, and why is the bear hanging out with a, a mouse? I've never seen a, a bear here before. Pay no attention to the bear. It's me, Chuck E. Cheese in the flesh. I'm here to help wish you a very happy birthday. Ah, oh, Chuck E. Cheese. Oh, sweet. I love Chuck E. Cheese. Incredible. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Thanks, kids. Hey, hey, kiddos. Does anyone want to take a picture with their old pal, Peppy Panda? Hey, hey, you. You, the panda. Come over uh -huh. here. Uh huh. Come over here. Okay, Do I gotta yell at you? Over Come there. over here. Okay, watch your arms. You walk really weird. You walk with a lot of arm movement. <laughs> Listen, I'm here. I'm Detective Chuck E. Cheese. Okay? Head of security at Chuck E. Cheese Detectives. You, sir, are fired. You're fired because you're scaring people, quite frankly. People don't understand you. They can't, they can't get what you're doing. No one knows you're a panda. You're hitting a I lot mean, of people. I, I don't need to go on. Listen, I, I, I spent months developing an elaborate backstory for Peppy Panda. First of all, he was raised by a pack of wolves in the Australian outback. He was lost from a, from a shipwreck. And, um, you know, his mother and father were, were, were refugees, really. 
And so Peppy Panda is really about overcoming adversity and inspiring others through positivity and good and good vibrations in life. All right, so- kid. All right, kid. All right. Nobody cares about vibrations. Nobody cares about being good. You're done. You're fired. You're out. Okay. I don't want to say it again. Wow, it's just highly disappointing. Uh, also, I forgot to mention, but there are two people who've been slowly drowning in the ball pit for the last several hours. I'll come in and save you, kiddo! <laughs> Hi! Joe, let me just jump on in and rescue these children! Hello! Hi there! Oh, what's your name there? Timmy! Oh, Timmy! Well, you're just an adorable little tyke. What birthday is this for you, Timmy? Twelve teen. You're 12 teen. Well, let's get you out of this dangerous ball pit. Now, who's this other individual that's drowning over here? What? That's my it dad. Looks like- Save my dad. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> my name is Bob. I work for the Ford Motor Company. Your name is B- You work yeah. for the Ford Motor Company? Get out of here. You can drown for all I care. <laughs> my, my. My parents died in a flaming accident in the Ford Phallus. The sexiest car ever to hit the road, Ford Phallus. Oh, hey. Hey, Jack. Is this the Ford Phallus? Jack, your parents got you a Ford Phallus for your birthday? You know it. You you know it. This car rides so hot. It is so smooth. It's like flying on fire. Wow, Whoa. Jack. This is so cool, man. Your parents got you the Ford Phallus for your birth for your birthday, man. Hey, can I can I check out the waterbed in the back there? Sure. Just can, to strictly man. test it out. It's like so I'm not gonna rad. do any any weird stuff back there. Just get on. No weird like stuff, it, like, but you can test it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whoa! This is all awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh man, look at this. Look at this. I sit my butt in it deep and then I'm making my head bobble. I love water. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like, like oh, look, weird. At, look at my booby steering wheel. This is incredible. Look at it. Woo! Wow. This, those, Dude, those tenet, too. No problem. So cool. Wow. I don't know. I've never actually seen real boobies. So I guess that's what they look like. <laughs> He's a pretty true to life. Pretty true to life. Oh, well, you <laughs> know, Jack, right? With the powerful <laughs> palace, I bet you're getting a lot of boobies. You know it. Um, hey there. I just was walking by and I couldn't help but notice your big Ford Phallus. What a beautiful car that is. Do you mind if I touch it? Oh, please oh. do. It's so soft oh. to the touch. Oh, no. God. Marianne Parker. This... Whoa. Now, now that she said something, this car is very soft. It, it, the exterior is kind of mushy. Has anyone noticed that? <clears throat> It feels like human skin. It warms up when you start to drive it. Okay. Oh. I'd love it if you'd rev your engine for me. <laughs> Whoa. Man. Oh, man. It's Jack, good. dude, I definitely think you're going to get to second base, man. Mary, it's like the hottest girl in school. Oh, my God. Your parents are the <laughs> I know, coolest. Bro. I know. I know. Let's hear that engine rev again. Oh my <laughs> God. It is that the sounds like a panther in heat. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. It sounds like a prepubescent panther. Oh wow! Maybe I'll just go make myself comfortable on that waterbed. Oh God. I just know it, man. I wish my parents would get me a phallus. I really need one. <clears throat> There's been a recall issued for the Ford Phallus. Uh, anybody who's known to be driving a Ford Phallus, we ask you to please sheathe your phallus for the moment in your garage until we can arrange for your phallus to be transported to uh, some sort of factory that fixes phalluses. T- Tina, 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 get in here. You got to like this television report. We need to, we're going to need to talk to Jack. What? He is, oh, uh, no. 
Yeah. I, I know he's been so excited about his phallus, but. I mean, who isn't excited about a phallus? <laughs> I know I am. Oh, gosh. Um, I think we should just call him in here and yeah. just break the news to him in the most he's gonna, gentle, he's gonna have to soothing it fashion. <clears throat> what's up mom what's what's going on what's up dad hey, said, hey Jack. What? um yeah just uh just have a seat <clears throat> we're okay, gonna need yeah. your car keys we're gonna need to take your car keys whoa dad uh, come on, dude what did it, i do it's not it's this not us it's the government down. it's not us it's the government it's not us it's the government i am having a really good time I know you are i know you are and you know your mother and i will buy you literally son, anything son, you ask it is for not Son, this is this is out of our control. We yeah, can't and we, we cannot. This is completely out of our control. We're we're happy to replace it with a Camaro or or a Thunderbird. <laughs> Camaro. Or, or, what or, does a Camaro sound like when the, its engine revs? Not like <laughs> not like the phallus, I'll tell you that much, Dad. I have no, I, I seventeen understand. girlfriends right now. This is king time of my life. Yeah, I, it's, the, it's not me. Yeah, it's the is, government and that right. damn regulation is just coming down hard on us. But it we've got to send regulation. that phallus back in for repairs. And um, there's not much we can do about it. I'm so sorry. Can we buy your love in another way, Jack? Sure. Does your son or daughter, has it, are they experiencing acute phallus loss? Are they, were they the friends, the phallus envy of all their friends, only to find that now they have nothing to lord over those other social peers of theirs that were phallus challenged for some period of time? Well, I offer you this, this solution, the new Ford Volvo, consider it. <laughs> Uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, the well moral played. of the story well, is that uh, what well you played. name a car is very, very, very <laughs> important. <laughs> uh, that was, uh, do we have to, we're gonna have to put some kind of a warning there. Yeah. The, uh... <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I knew I was going a little blue, and I apologize. Oh, yeah. uh, we all, I think we I all think went there we together. All did. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, that's our episode. I want to thank my guests. I want to say uh, thank you to Griffin Taylor, Joanna Senator, and, as always, Kristen Dredding. Before we go, though, let's do some shameless self-promotion, uh, starting with Griffin. Hey, all right. I feel like my plugs are going to be the same as Joanna's. <laughs> we got our monthly show at the Broadwater slash Pack Theater for Year on Mute um, every or first Saturday night of the month. And we're also going to be doing the Hollywood uh, Fringe Festival coming up. I'm not sure the exact day on that. June um, 10th. June 10th. June 10th. June 10th. Um, so, yeah. So look for the, the monthly show. And I think, Billy, you're, you're doing the, the next one. With us, but I won't be the, yeah, the, the, the French festival one because it's my yeah. 20th wedding anniversary, but uh, oh, so I've taken the time month of June to reflect on my life choices. <laughs> careful, careful. Yeah, uh-oh. Uh, in ways, I, ways that I can improve. <laughs> Nicole doesn't listen to the podcast. Um, <laughs> this is how you punish her. <laughs> No, I'm not punishing her. You're gonna listen to it tonight, Nicole. Uh, <laughs> she does come to our show. <laughs> yeah, she does come yeah. to our show, as you both know, every yeah. single one. That's right. Yeah, she does. As does Pam. Uh, Joanna, where can people find you? Well, um, I don't know if you've heard about this incredible sketch comedy group called You're on Mute, but we That's perform right. the first Saturday of every month at 10 p.m. at the Broadwater Theater in lovely Hollywood, California. That's wonderful. Uh, and if people want to find your on mute on the internet or socials, what is the social handle? This is a test. Oh, uh, you're, you're <laughs> on I think mute. I'm the only one who knows. You're on mute live. Your underscore on underscore mute underscore live. No underscore. Something like that. Kristen, <laughs> where can people find you other than just generally Austin, Texas? But, you know, 
if if you you're looking join for the a internet specific, yeah a specific spot though in austin texas i typically can be found next to north america's largest urban bat colony uh on the near the congress avenue bridge <laughs> but when not creeping around around there uh, i also teach classes at cold town theater uh, hideout and merlin works and fallout theater so a uh, four for four for all four uh, improv schools in town so can't miss me um and also i'm on the internet i have now finally acceded to the many like like bitter outcries by those who could not find me before so i have an instagram <laughs> it is k-r-i-s-t-e-n-d-r-e-n-n-i-n-g that's it kristen draining at kristen you're giving the people what they want that's what right they demand really serving serving of nothing but pictures of me where i've photoshopped myself to look like a clown so <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm Billy DeClerc. You can find me on the internet and the socials at Comedy Lawyer on every major whatever. I don't post anything. That's our show. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>